Center. My co-moderator this morning is Joe Sharma, Associate Professor at the University of Toronto's Culinary Research Center and Project Lead for Feeding the City, Pandemic and Beyond. Behind the scenes is Brian Dale, Culinary Postdoc Fellow and Feeding the City Project Manager with Juan Loren from the project's digital team and Steve Fiorti, who is assisting with technical logistics. Today, we welcome you to Voices from Local Grocery Stores and Public Markets in a Diverse City, the second installment of our webinar series. Feeding the City brings together a team of scholars and community stakeholders to document the impact of the current pandemic on food systems, to consider the challenges, highlight local response efforts, efforts and learn how communities could be supported going forward. This morning's virtual roundtable brings together three people who work directly in the food provisioning systems of a diverse global city, Toronto. We want to know how have local markets and grocery stores pivoted in the time of COVID-19 to continue feeding their communities? How can these local businesses help build a resilient food system in a diverse city? What new challenges and opportunities lay ahead? Please note that this public session is being recorded. Everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording by email at a later date. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land where we are. We recognize that the space where many of us work and live is on the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, Seneca, and most recently, Mississaugas of the Credit River. But we also recognize that such land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense as colonialism is a current ongoing process. We call on each of us to think of such relationships of land, people, power, intersectionality, and struggles for equity across and beyond the spaces where we see ourselves as belonging. Particularly relevant to our conversation is the indigenous law of this land that lies in the dish with one spoon territory the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound people to the territory and protect the land. This law asks that those who live here share responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty. This includes taking care of the land and all of the creatures with whom we share it. Let me now turn to each of our panelists today to introduce them. Mario Maselli's is a second generation Italian Canadian grocer. He and his family own Maselli's, a grocery store that is operated at the same Toronto location since 1959. Each week they deal with over 25 small producers and are locally renowned for making heritage foods such as their own Italian sausage and for personalized customer service on everything from cheese to rosemary plants. Rangoel is founder and CEO of Fresh City Farms. He describes the business as a values-driven company which aims to source locally and organically whenever possible and to operate sustainably with minimal environmental impact and high labor standards. They grow a portion of their produce at their urban farm, while the remainder of their products are sourced from Southern Ontario and abroad. Marina Carollo is a member of the Toronto Food Policy Council and previously managed food programs at the Evergreen Brickworks, where she created a suite of programs to promote food literacy, community development, local entrepreneurship, and placemaking. When she first moved to Canada from Argentina, she was renowned for her circle empanadas that sold at fine food shops and farmers markets. Now, before we launch into the round table, a note on the format and how we see the next hour and a bit unfolding. I will shortly turn things over to Joe. We'll begin by posing a few questions to each panelist individually. After that, we have the chance to learn, after we have the chance to learn more about each panelist's work, we will open up the discussion and ask to respond to a few questions in conversation with one another. We'll then leave ample time for audience Q&A at the end. Some of you have already shared questions for the panelists with us when you registered, and we will bring a few of those questions into the discussion. I'd also like to draw your attention to the Q&A box, which should be visible on your screen. You're invited to type questions into it, and we'll pose them to our speakers in the final part of the roundtable. Your questions are also important for the larger Feeding the City project, 
as they will inform our future work and programming. So we thank you in advance. Okay, over to Joe. Uh, good morning, everyone, and hello to Mario. Hello. Um, um, Mario is joining us today from his shop, Mercedes. So picture him sitting there surrounded by the shelves of amazing uh, food items, many of them from Italy and beyond. And of course, on the main part of the store where I must tell you, I visit at least twice a week. <laughs> I walk over there as so many of my neighbors from the Stanford neighborhood in the east end of Toronto do. And what we are privileged to buy there is a whole lot of uh, local items, local produce, as well as specialty items, many of them from Italy and the handcrafted items like the Italian sausage. Mario's father opened the store in 1959, almost 60 years ago, and he and his brothers run it. And there are seven other staff members who work there. It is very much a store where the customers and the staff all know each other. It very much part of it is face-to-face -face encounters. I still remember how almost a decade ago, uh, some of us new parents in this neighborhood asked Mario to stock organic milk for our kids and he started doing so. And of course now even that range has greatly expanded. And of course in a few days, we are going to see the panettone, the seasonal wonderful Christmas uh, time um, baked uh, item, the cake from Italy on the shelves. So Mario, uh, welcome to the round table. Thank you so much for sharing your time. How do you Thank see you. the changes oh. in the business, especially since your brothers and you took over over the last few years? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, as you know, uh, we opened up, my father opened up in November of 1959. It was the uh, first food shop on the Danforth. Um, not the first fruit stand, but the first food shop. If you wanted a can of something from Italy or uh, Canada uh, to do a regular shopping uh, spree, you would have to go to Maselli's. And then in, in a few years, a lot of shop, other shops have opened up. Uh, the general uh, area was mostly uh, European, a lot of Italians, a lot of Greeks, uh, a little bit of Portuguese. Um, and they were like a Protestant ethic. They would go to work, they would save their money, and Saturday, Friday was the big shopping day, and uh, they would buy a lot of groceries because they had larger families. Uh, but that over the years has sort of dissipated. They've retired, the kids have moved away, so now it's become like a, a daily routine to go and buy what, what they need. But other people have moved into the area, and... Um, and we do the best we can to service the uh, community. A lot of foodies have moved in, and we try to we try to adapt to what customers are asking for. You can always uh, uh, go on our on our uh, web page, and 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 I would like to see that in your store, and we'll do our best to get it right. And uh, we're trying to adapt to the new changes in this world, also. Well, one of the uh, ways in which, for instance, uh, Mario supplies customers is uh, uh, some of us foodies <laughs> encountered a new vegetable, at least to us in Ontario, puntarelle, which is an Italian green. I remember a year ago, we spoke to him and we asked him if they could stock it. And uh, Mario, I don't know how he did it, but he managed to get a local Ontario grower to stock it. And in fact, just this week, we had the privilege of getting that in. But part of uh, what Mario has also told us is how he personally goes at least three times a week to the Ontario food terminal to source the freshest produce. And then that comes to his store. So Mario, if you could give our audience and us a little bit of what is involved in those personalized supplier relationships, uh, whether the local ones or the ones with importers who bring in uh, the products from Italy and other places, and how have those, uh, relationships with suppliers and the way in which you work together changed over the course of the pandemic because obviously one of the big issues that has arisen are supply chain issues. Thanks. Yes. Well, um, 
what has changed since the uh, COVID is that, first of all, all the sales reps, let's, let's start with the grocery, the imported items and that. Uh, first, the sales reps would come to our store and take our orders, introduce new products, and uh, try to make out a deal, put something on special, and they would uh, let us know what's new to Canada, what's, what's being discontinued, what's coming in. But since the COVID, that has changed a little bit. We were doing a lot on the phone or email. Uh, the invoices have gone paperless. Supplies are hit and miss because of uh, border restrictions. And even at the Ontario Food Terminal, before at the Ontario Food Terminal, I would go there, swipe, go in, uh, park my, my truck, and walk around and pick and choose what uh, I wanted. And I would hand pick everything for my store. Uh, since COVID, uh, we are not allowed to, uh, we were not allowed to leave our trucks. We would find a parking spot, and everything had to be done uh, either online or by text. And this is where good relationships are very important, where you're, you would call your sales rep or text them, and he knew that the, the quality that you wanted for your store and not send you anything inferior. Not just for my store, I'm speaking for every uh, local market. Uh, and yeah, as I said, we weren't allowed to leave. The only time you could leave your truck was to go and load up and inspect your goods. And uh, we were not allowed to go into the shops or touch anything or walk along the docks. So that's changed a little bit. And the supply also. So not everything was available every day due to the COVID restrictions at the borders and, and uh, the, the trucks were not arriving on time. When the local farmers started, it was the same idea. You built up a relationship over the years and you would call, let's say, uh, Shabatour Produce. Hi, this is Maselli's, all by text. Uh, send me this, 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 and load me up and whatnot. Uh, Gomes Produce. These are my, my big guys, the guys I use a lot. They're very prestigious growers in Ontario, especially Gomes. Um, and they would send the product to my truck, invoice the store, and I would mail them a check. No cash, no more cash or, or exchange of anything. Be now it's loosened up a little bit. You have to wear masks and you can walk around. You can't, still can't touch anything. You can order and they will bring it to your truck. So it's a, it's a, little, it's a little different game plan now. But it, it, um, the uh, supplies are okay. Um, as far as getting stuff uh, imported and trucking as Ontario trucks it in from the United States or Mexico, that still is a little bit of a hit and miss. The local growers now are, the season is coming to an abrupt end. And, uh, but uh, the, the availability is still around. Uh, the, you, you, you just have to work harder to get it to your store. Thanks, Maria. Uh, let's um, uh, move on to the final question in this round for you. Um, yeah. So from your point of view then, what are the overall major ways in which the business had had to change after Mar late March, 2020? So customers like myself experience the front end changes such as socially distanced lines to enter, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, sanitizing of carts. But we would like to hear, especially for a family business, how operating the business has changed. What does your day-to-day -day look like now? What does it mean for a business where face-to-face -face interaction is so important? Well, face-to-face -face, uh, will never change in retail, first of all. But as you said, there are sanitizing stations. We must wear face masks. Uh, there are uh, social distancing in the store. Uh, over the years, I've been promoted to doorman to count the number of customers to in, and we control that also. Uh, the big change now is, that uh, the customers uh, that come in, we have po posted signs that cannot touch the produce too much. You would just probably pick the orange or apple that you want and put it in your bag. As far as the meat and belly, uh, there's no more sampling and that, that's, that's quite unfortunate. Um, but basically, on, uh, the, the service counters have not changed. You will go and order your deli, order your cheese, order your meat, and it will 
the, the, the staff will package it properly and give it to you. Uh, we also uh, back uh, try to avoid uh, delivery and uh, curbside and all that over the years. But now, adapting, we are going back full swing on, uh, on delivery service, curbside pickup. Um, if you can't wear, if you can't uh, wear a mask, we will ask you to wait outside, and I, I or one of the staff will take your order, go inside, put it together, and bring it to you. Uh, we're doing a lot of e- uh, emailing wherever some some senior citizens can't come out, or some people are working from home, so they email us their order. We consolidate it, put it together, uh, arrange for payment, and we deliver it. And th- those are the the changes actually that that has that's basically it. Those are the changes that have happened uh, during the COVID in a, on our end of our re- retail shop, food shop. Sorry, muted there. <laughs> Just for yourself and your family and the staff members, if you can talk yeah. about how you change your daily life. For instance, one of the things you had to do was you know, close on Sundays and you had posted a notice right at the start of the pandemic, you know, and that's something I think our audience would really want to hear. The humans- well, uh, be- sorry, because of the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic, we, uh, we have shortened our hours. That gives the staff a break. It also gives the public, uh, the, the neighborhood a break. So you won't be out that much. You would come and shop. Uh, let's just say, get it done get your shopping done and head back home um yes we 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 had to fall back to closing on sundays it uh, made a few customers unhappy but uh, we chose that that's the right thing to do to eliminate a lot of people walking around as i said shorter hours uh and uh, minimizing the amount of people that come into the store it all it all plays one big factor it's uh if from from shorter hours to 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 closing on Sundays to food handling, it all plays a big part of uh, the pandemic has made each sec each part of this puzzle play its own play its own part. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Joe. Oh, I, I got you. Our next panelist, Rangoel, will share with us some of his experience feeding the city of Toronto and the greater Toronto area over the course of the pandemic through his initiative, Fresh City Farms. I'll turn it back over to Joe for some questions. Uh, Hello, Ran. Um, Fresh City Farm may be the only grocery business to appear in Dragon's Den as you did in season 10 of 2016. The clip is still online if anyone wants to watch it. How has your business evolved between that time in 2020, and what are its unique characteristics? Um, uh, thank you, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very appreciative. And uh, Mario, really great to hear your perspective. Uh, a lot of parallels, so it's uh, always great to hear that the trenches look the same in other parts of the city, because uh, you're so focused on the day-to-day. Uh, yeah, Dragon's Den, uh, what's changed since then? So, um, I'd say probably two major things. Uh, so we, we, we've contacts, we've, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, you know, historically we were just online and certainly if you look at that pitch, you know, the focus was on our online uh, business uh, and that's still the biggest part of our business. Uh, but we've also uh, started opening uh, bricks and mortar um, locations as well. Uh, and have really done kind of tripled down on um, on prepared food. So we really have uh, created a, a strong in-house capacity uh, to create a wide assortment of prepared foods that we can um, stand behind in terms of uh, having sourced the ingredients, um, uh, mostly organic, uh, very big focus on local, uh, packaged them uh, in, a, in a fashion that's as sustainable as possible. So often being able to use uh, reusable containers uh, like our jars that are returned to us and uh, bottles and things like that uh, or recyclable uh, when, when not. Um, so that's kind of two big, I think, uh, differences from when we did our pitches that we've really um, you know, gone all in on uh, prepared foods um, and added uh, a bricks and mortar element to the business. Uh, and then of course, I mean, COVID has um, upended a lot, of, uh, a lot of what we do. Uh, certainly we do m- even more business online now um, as a percentage of, uh, of revenue. Um, and I think the, um, 
the you know the if you look at the pitch that you know there was a lot of um, uh, skepticism and uh, I should note on this whole Dragon's Den thing you know the the actual taping is an hour long but they cut it down to you know, seven minutes of drama um, but uh, it, it's actually you know the the online grocery proposition I think back then uh, was uh, much more doubtful I think a lot of people had questions around whether um, there was sufficient demand for it. Uh, and certainly that changed uh, even before COVID, but I think after COVID kind of everyone gets that, uh, you know, a portion of food sales and certainly uh, uh, fresh food sales, grocery sales uh, will will happen online. Uh, and the question is just how to do it um, economically. Um, so I'd say, yeah, from the, um, the, the, the context has, has changed quite a bit since, um, since that episode aired. Thanks, Ryan. And, uh... Uh, I wanted to uh, shift the discussion now, as we did uh, for Mercedes, to talk a little bit about the uh, staffing and other implications of these changes that first, for instance, you have several physical locations now, especially since Fresh City uh, Farm is now associated with Healthy Butcher and um, Mabel's Bakery as well. And in fact, that you now, not only do you have customers like myself who've never visited a physical location <laughs> since I don't go to the West End, but certainly as an example, the two products I love this week that I ordered online were Chanterelles from British Columbia and um, the living pea shoots, which I understand come from a local grower. Yeah. So yeah, so this question really focuses on asking you more about supply chains and um, the ways in which the staffing impact that COVID has had, the impact of the everyday staffing and how the business has shown, I think, a huge amount of resiliency. But, you know, it would really be good to know about the human impact of that. Thanks. Yeah, so maybe I can step back a bit. So even, you know, before COVID, uh, the company uh, nine, uh, just over nine years ago, you know, one of my hopes was to create a, a, a great workplace. And I think uh, we've been partly successful at that. Um, but the part I'd say we've not been successful is around, you know, the, at the lower end of the wage spectrum, uh, being able to pay our staff um, a living wage. And I think that's um, an endemic problem, uh, certainly in Toronto with, uh, with the cost of uh, living is. So right now, depending on who you ask and how you calculate it, uh, a living wage is around 20 to $21 an hour so and the idea being that you know if two people work full-time making that wage uh you could raise uh you know you can have a family of, of two kids so that's kind of the, the paradigm they use uh, rightly or wrongly uh suffice it to say regardless of what the actual number should be you know the minimum wage today does not reflect um you know if you work uh, full-time making minimum wage uh it's hard to uh, make a go of it in this uh, in the city given what housing costs uh transportation costs and food costs um, so I, I know I, I uh, I've always been kind of attuned to that, uh, and you know trying to find ways to to kind of improve um, you know what what we can offer our staff. So we've done uh, you know things like provide health and dental benefits um, to full time staff, uh, you know provide uh, free lunch um, at our warehouse, uh, but that doesn't kind of I guess overcome the fact that we we for a lot of our staff we can't afford our cost structure doesn't allow us to pay them. Uh, uh, any semblance of, of a living wage. Um, so that's kind of how we, we entered the, um, the pandemic. And I think early on, obviously, you know, we, uh, all of us were uh, beyond grateful uh, for our uh, frontline workers, our essential workers, uh, certainly in healthcare, uh, but also across other essential services, uh, including grocery. And, uh, you know, for, for, for us, it was, um, it was, it was a time of, um, I don't know how to describe it. There was a surreal element to it, and there was uh, a lot of anxiety among staff, um, it, especially in the first um, few weeks, where you know testing was essentially impossible to access, where uh, best practices weren't laid out by public health or other other government authorities, uh, where um, you know you didn't, you couldn't, you know, you, you had to uh, lead um, um, in a way that you know was. Uh, tra you have to be very transparent about the fact that essentially, you know, we don't know what the risks are ultimately, and we don't know how to prevent this. So aside from obviously, you know, hand washing and sanitizing, and uh, that was a big theme early on is like, you know, deep clean all the time, deep clean all the time. 
and of course, you know, now we realize that's a part of the mix, but uh, uh, arguably more important or as important part is, you know, masking and distancing. Um, so, so, so that's where, you know, for for us uh, managing that anxiety was uh, was really tough, and it was. It was I think, doubly tough in the sense of, uh, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I'm part of these two bubbles, you know, day to day, I go into the stores, into the kitchen, to the warehouse, and I'm uh, kind of involved, um, you know, in a very kind of hands-on way. Um, uh, but I'm also, you know, I went to law school, I'm a lawyer, and most of my friends, a lot of my friends are lawyers or professionals. Uh, so there was, there was this bubble uh, of people working from home and, you um, uh, complaining about real but relatively first world problems about you know you know the working from home and how uh, isolating that was and, and etc. Obviously not, not discounting that, uh, but then there you know then there's people who who have to go into work and um, it wasn't really a choice for them because they, if they didn't have the next paycheck um, they wouldn't be able to make uh, ends meet um, and, and that's where it kind of you saw I think it the inequities. Uh, in our in our country come to life uh, in a way that um, you know wasn't as I think front and center for most people uh, where yeah you have people who were asthmatic or had immune um, disorders or um, all sorts of sort of uh, uh, put them at a higher profile uh, of risk uh, for uh, complications due to COVID uh, who went into work and just didn't really have a real choice as it were um, even though it was a really a big Big health uh, health risk for them. Um, so I'll say, I mean, we I think we managed as well as we could. Um, um, and so, so we have about two hundred and fifty staff. Uh, we don't uh, we don't believe there was any workplace transmission. At least nobody's uh, um, nobody's tested positive as a result of somebody else having uh, contracted for someone else in the workplace that we know of. Um, uh, you know, we, we had to, as an organization, become really good at stuff that I wouldn't have dreamed of, uh, like contact tracing. So, uh, you know, we have had a couple of people who've tested positive uh, from their household, from the community. And, uh, you know, once they receive the positive test, have to go backwards and figure out, you know, who worked next to them and was it a close contact, was it not, um, and all that. Um, and again, all against the background of, uh, I think, you know, um, let's just say not optimal government response, um, certainly from a testing perspective. So I, I think we've, uh, I feel, and certainly I think a lot of other business owners feel that the, uh, the testing regime in particular in Ontario um, has left a lot to be desired uh, at certain points, uh, a bit less so now, but certainly in the first wave and then in the second wave as well. Um, so, so that's been tough. So I think the, the, the broad perspective is one of, uh, you know, we, we 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 did the best we could under the circumstances. Um, our staff uh, were incredible. You know, for the most part, uh, everyone showed up um, in spite of the um, of the of the risk. Uh, and, and I think there was a sense um, for the for the first time that kind of um, uh, bubbled up of you know people recognizing the value of of uh, what what staff were doing. Uh, whereas, you know, in the past, you know. Uh, delivery drivers or retail staff or kitchen staff, you know, uh, you know, I, I would speak to uh, how important the work they were doing was, uh, but they, I don't think there was a public uh, recognition of that. And I think w w one thing that was great about um, um, uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, in its tragedy was that there was a sense of appreciation for, for frontline workers. Uh, and I'll say I was pretty optimistic um, early on, I'd say, um, you know, in, uh, in uh, May, June, that, um, this would portend, you know, more permanent changes for how we think of essential workers uh, from a policy perspective, um, in terms of, you know, whether it's minimum wage or uh, universal basic income or, you know, all, all, all these kinds of things that uh, I think we need to move forward on. Uh, and uh, I'm not as optimistic as I was um, then. I mean, you've definitely seen um, um, it, it, it kind of move to the background of the conversation and you're already seeing, you know, the, uh, all the status quo nicks saying, you know, we can't do this, we can't afford this. Da, 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 da. Um, so that's unfortunate. I mean, I've uh, I'm going to certainly do do my best to advocate for it. But um, you know, for for me, a big moment uh, was you know in June, uh, in, I think it was late June, when um, the big grocers all withdrew their their coronavirus uh, wage premiums, and uh, it was just this moment of like. WTF, you know, in my mind, because it was, you know, on one hand, you know, Black Lives Matters protesters uh, were in the streets, the pandemic was still going on, the lockdown hadn't been lifted yet. And, uh, 
they, I, I think there was a, a huge missed opportunity um, on behalf of the leadership of those companies uh, who have in the past um, uh, cooperated, shall we say, uh, to, uh, uh, to divide up the market, if you will, or to fix bread prices, for example. Uh, and I think there was an opportunity then for them to get together and say, you know what, guys, I'll, you know, we'll keep the premium, you keep the premium, and guess what? Prices will be a bit higher for the customer, but we'll be able to pay people a more decent wage. And um, they they walked away from that opportunity. Um, and now, you know, they're they're saying they will support, you know, higher minimum wage and stuff like that. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but I think that was a huge waste, a waste of opportunity because for us, ultimately, you know, we're um, we're a very small player, uh, extremely like we're a speck of dust in their kind of sandbox. Uh, and so, you know, there is a limit to what we can push forward on and to how you know, which we, we can increase prices to um, to enable uh, a better wage for our uh, lower paid staff. Um, so it's really going to require leadership from from them, and, 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 and in this case in particular. And sorry if I'm taking too long and veering off topic a bit here, uh, but really, you know, it's if industry can come to to the to the table uh, and say, this is what we think will work, um, whether it's minimum wage or living wage or benefits or anything or sick leave, vacation. Uh, I think that it's a very different conversation from just saying no, we can't do it. Just don't don't increase minimum wage, which historically is what the knee-jerk reaction has been. Uh, so I'm not one to say that government always gets it right. And I don't even think, for example, minimum wage, I think should be increased, but should be done in a, in a dynamic way where it's a different minimum wage for different jurisdictions based on the cost of living to, 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 to reflect that. Um, so I do think, you know, the, the, I, I do hope that at the very least, um, there is a bit more of a cooperative um, sense and to just lift all boats. So it's not a they should be agnostic about uh, some of these issues uh, as long as everyone is subject to the same rules. So they're not at a competitive disadvantage compared to you know, Loblaws vis-a-vis -vis -vis Sobeys, or Sobeys vis-a-vis -vis Costco. Um, so that's kind of my hope, but, uh, but big picture, I mean, our, our staff have been, have been amazing. I mean, uh, uh, people have shown up. There was definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety early on. Um, I think we've um, done as good a job as we can at, uh, at managing that. Um, and um, yeah, I think my, my hope is that this public consciousness around essential workers translates into, um, into policy changes ultimately. Thank you so much, Ran. I think you've actually, you know, brought up many of the issues <laughs> through working from the experience uh, from your own uh, business to the larger issues. In fact, because one of the questions that's just come in was asking if the pandemic has better prepared us for future crises, if there's anything we've learned during this time that'll carry on even after this pandemic is over. And I think in fact, through your through you know your response, you've kind of indicated that. And I hope everyone who's listening to this webinar, I feel all of us agree that this kind of role that frontline workers and as pertains to the food system in particular is really really important and as you say policy change can only happen when there's concerted public pressure and in a systemic way and so i think you know that is also how we see our role as a similar speck of dust but in raising consciousness for these issues and hearing from people who are <laughs> on the front lines like the speakers today. So I have a very uh, quick uh, last question, but which is important because many people may not know that you get your name Fresh City Farm is because there is actually a farm uh, out of which uh, the grocery store business has is risen and it very much continues to be there. And I think which also signals another important issue, the importance of the local pro producers urban growing and as Mario mentioned it's kind of winding up for the season but if Ran you can very quickly tell us how the farm has uh, the impact on it has been from the pandemic and how it's affected say getting the produce out to customers but also audience members are asking about uh, you know how say waste food waste and so on say <laughs> pumpkins, somebody has just asked about pumpkins, how they might be recycled back to avoid food waste and how, uh, you know, that uh, kind of uh, makes the food supply chain better. Uh, that's, that's a great question. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, COVID in a way has had very, uh, uh, very little, if any impact on the farm. Uh, it's impacted how the farm is viewed, I think. So 
by that I mean, uh, you know, if you if you want to talk about a distanced environment outdoors, uh, the farm is perfect. So in terms of uh, from a COVID risk perspective, uh, it was very easy to manage, uh, to, to manage compared to the retail stores where you have thousands of customers locking in every day that have to be managed or the kitchen where people were working too close together. We had to figure out ways to distance people uh, or, um, you know, an office environment where too many people were working per square foot. Uh, so the farm, as it, as it were, was uh, actually very easy to deal with in the scheme of things. Um, and uh, in the, but, but, but in terms of how it's been uh, viewed, it's been interesting because uh, there, again, part of the consciousness raising, I think, has been around um, where is our food coming from? You know, there's all, suddenly you're seeing in the, in the news, you know, 80 percent of our beef comes from two plants in Alberta and uh, the U.S. borders closed. So, so suddenly this idea that there's a food security issue, I think, percolates up because if you told people a year ago that, you know, we should try to produce more of our produce in Canada because you never know what's going to happen in the U.S. or the border, they would be like, you're crazy. But here we are, you know, seven months later and we can't, uh, you know, people can't move across the border. Uh, but it's not a stretch to think that eventually products won't be able to move across the border either. Um, so I think people looked at, uh, you know, I had friends who were like, you know, if, if the, if the if the if the doo doo hits the proverbial fan, you know, can we can you feed us from your farm? And I'm like, uh, yeah, th it's a good thing you're thinking along those lines, guys. Like, what what one of the reasons, uh, you know, we promote local food. Uh, so um, you know, so the, the the COVID impact of things has been less on our day to day operating activities at the farm, uh, but certainly around the consciousness. So we've, for example, we we sell seedlings uh, uh, through our online platform every year in our stores, and those sold out within a couple of hours as people were. I think A, they had more time on their hands and B, they were like, oh, it'd be good to grow some of my own food. Um, uh, so th those did well. Uh, we had way more visitors at the farm this year, just uh, dro people dropping in uh, because they had more time on their hands and just walking through the park. Uh, Downsview Park is where the farm is located. Um, so we started like a self-serve farm stand kind of in the spirit of you know in, in rural areas in Ontario where you can just pick up eggs uh, so we replicated that and that's done uh, that's done well um, so there's definitely uh, you know it's been uh, it's been it's been great in terms of um, recognition of the food security issue of the value of, of local production uh, but thankfully it hasn't had a huge impact on uh, from, a, from a COVID perspective. Yes, I definitely think you have highlighted some of the kind of future takeaway messages from the pandemic. And again, <laughs> even at Mario's store, <laughs> they did run out very quickly of things like the basil plants, even though there was a large supply. And I know from Fresh City, I tried to get something and I think it was sold out within one day. And of course, Richter's Herbs, where many of us get our tomato plants and herbs and so on, did not even bother to supply <laughs> locally this time because apparently they exhausted all their stock in mail order. So I think there is this kind of, uh, I think what your, um, you know, the first two uh, speakers have really shown us is how in this diverse city, we have local and global systems at work, but that the local one, it's so important and that people are realizing the importance and it's up to us really to translate that public awareness into the policy realm. And this is a perfect point perhaps to, I'll move to our third speaker over to Jackie and to Marina, who from being a practitioner uh, when she first arrived in uh, Toronto several years ago is now policy, also a policymaker. Thank you, Marina. Over to you, Jackie and Marina. Thank you, Ren. Thanks, Joe. So we'll shift now from talking about the grocery business and locally based enterprises um, to the role that public markets can play in feeding the city. Um, Marina, you've been a practitioner, as Joe mentioned, in the world of food provisioning, a maker of handicra uh, handcrafted empanadas, then a market manager, um, and now you're an activist and advocate for public markets. Can you tell us a little bit about your trajectory? Um, how does the past experience as a practitioner inform the work that you're doing today? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And it was amazing. This journey that you have planned for couldn't have been perfect and better prepared. It looks like you know what you're doing. Um, so for me, uh, it's great that I'm coming just like listening to Ran and listening to Mario um, because there's so many connections. And, uh, 
and um, between the work that I'm going to be showcasing today and uh, and their experiences and and so the root causes of some of the things that they have actually talked about and so Going back to my trajectory, so I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada 18 years ago. My background is marketing and design. And I think that approach of thinking and looking at things is what made me uh, always be curious and delving into on the ground action, but then looking at the big picture. Always like that approach of system thinking, like why is this happening? Uh, and so First, I was, as you said, in the on the ground doing business. I was part of Food Shares Kitchen Incubator, making empanadas, then selling at markets. That's when I fell in love with markets. And I discovered that I had always loved them throughout my life, but didn't know um, about them. Uh, then I managed a program, uh, both small markets, but then also big site activations. Uh, and uh, I learned so much over those years on the ground. And I wanted to ground my practice on research. So that's why I went back to school. I went to school to learn uh, what other thinkers um, are, are saying about the work that I was, my gut was telling me. My gut was telling me that there were some real problems behind the food system, uh, behind the work that I was doing in markets. Um, and, uh, and so since then, now I have that sort of thought uh, process uh, and I like to use it advocating for the right, uh, the right policies and also um, helping people understand. That's why I use a lot of visuals because the content that I'm going to share, it's very heavy. It's thinking like it's really helping you think and graphics allows us to visualize challenges uh, and simplify communication. Um, and so, but on the other hand, I continue to be on the ground. So during COVID, it was crazy. Uh, farmers markets closed from one day to another on March 14th. Um, I was engaged um, as a project lead for the Toronto Food Policy Council in the advocacy to make them essential. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I have a whole paper. 130 actions were involved, uh, bringing stakeholders together uh, to be able to advocate for something that the province originally had stated uh, that markets were essential and then they suddenly disappeared. And that journey of learning and understanding how we change policy in a time of crisis was um, impressive and has left me with a lot of reflections that other people might want to sort of think of. So I'm going to give you some words for you to uh, delve into after uh, or have further conversations. And, uh, and also, I want to tell you that, again, um, the work that I have done is, and you'll learn more, is grounded in that action. So I also, at the same time I was advocating for policy change, I had a local food pickup on my front door with 20 vendors for, that were supported while markets were closed. And again, that idea of like connecting on the ground action with policy is what needs to happen more often. And our government, unfortunately, is not doing so. The curiosity with regards to my, my trajectory was who did, how, like, I, I know that is difficult. I know the pandemic context was difficult, but I have some questions about the emergency order and the essential workplace. How did it work? Who did it benefit? Uh, they were grounded in the idea of public interest. Who's the public? Whose interests are we protecting when we are choosing those tools that give the government a lot of power? Why private spaces were seemed safe and public spaces were closed? Why, um, why is knowing that there's areas in our cities that are food deserts that rely on public markets and good food markets and all the types of markets that I'm gonna to show to you, suddenly uh, those were closed knowing that those areas would suffer because they do not have grocery stores. And so again, how do these decisions that are made on behalf of us as public interest technically uh, do not actually underline and continue to perpetuate this idea of elite accommodation where our government continues to make decisions that benefit a few as opposed to the majority and especially impacting the most vulnerable. So um, because I'm a problem solver, uh, because I don't like to sit down and complain um, I look for solutions. So I don't think like Ran, like, I, like you initially, I was happy. I thought 
the pandemic is going to open our eyes. Uh, but that faded very quickly. And so I don't think uh, our government really is going to actually um, help us build the food system we need unless we are very educated and we work together and we start to uh, really talk uh, collectively around the things that need to change and really connect the action on the ground. So um, we've seen the vulnerabilities, but we now have to actually come together to create the solutions ourselves. So this work that I'm doing is about creating the solutions ourselves. Thank you, Marina. That's fan that's fantastic. And so I'd love to, to get to talking about some of the um, solutions. Before we get there, can you um, tell us, you know, what is a public market in your view and what is the role of the public market and the potential for building a market city um, in Toronto? Um, yeah. And then I will do that uh, very quickly. And so I had like, a, obviously, I took so long in my first slide <laughs> and it was pretty boring. Uh, this is a much more interesting slide. And before we go into the solution, I'm going to just point you to, this is a map that we created with the Market City Initiative, which is the, the research project that I've been leading for the last five years. Uh, and this map shows uh, in, dot, in red dots uh, and colorful big dots, all the public markets that we have in our city. And, we, and we'll, we'll delve into what they are and who, how they look like, what they look like. It also shows the grocery stores in blue. Um, and uh, this is a broad scape. So grocery stores is a big word. Um, we have the large supermarket chains and we have the little mom and pop shop that are also considered grocery stores. So blue dots show that. And then the green shows income. And uh, it doesn't take two people, uh, more than two people to realize that both markets and grocery stores are not equitably distributed across our city. And that the relationship without going too deeply around income and so green means Dark greens means higher income, uh, light greens mean lower income. And so what are the areas that we need to prioritize when we're looking at strategies to really affect change within our food system? And it's more around the periphery of our city and not on our downtown core. And again, so when decisions were made to close and prioritize, close markets and priority to grocery stores, who was left out is probably all the people that are around. And what was the solution? Uh, a solution that was created years ago with ha that has to do with, um, a, 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 sorry, our charity relief efforts and food banks. And again, so this, this, uh, this pandemic has perpetuated something that was supposed to be a temporary solution. Now it has again, once again, become the mainstay of how we solve food security and food access in our city uh, while we leave uh, many of our food producers outside of the conversation, many of our food entrepreneurs, and many of the eaters as well. And so I have a lot more data around sort of the context and the, the, the inequalities that our food system was facing before the pandemic. And as I said in my first slide, the pandemic only made it visible to more people. Now, now the question is, what are we going to do now that we have seen them? How, what, how are we going to move forward? And so what is a public market? So this is an opportunity. And so again, this very quick snapshot, I have a report that is going to come out in the next few weeks. Uh, it's a 100 page report that is an intense, like a really in-depth analysis around where public markets are, challenges, opportunities, uh, and a whole slew of recommendations. So this work was done by engaging stakeholders over the last five years. Uh, and I love that we are in a space talking with retailers, uh, Fresh City Farms and uh, Marceline, uh, Marce Marcelli's, uh, because this is about public markets, but more important is about building the public food infrastructure. So the mid-sized public food infrastructure that supports equitable access to fresh food and culturally appropriate food, but also provides economic opportunities for small and medium businesses at a neighborhood or regional level. And so uh, how do we do that? Sorry, for the other side. How do we do that? We do it by strengthening short supply chains. And so, and that's what it becomes fun because when everybody thinks of public markets in our city, first of all, they don't understand the term. 
Uh, there's no policies around public markets. There's no definition around public markets. There's barely a definition around farmers markets. And we all default into farmers markets and farmers markets we know have some of the challenges because of the food system where they are located. And so in my work, we are intentional. What we're trying to do is strengthen short supplies chains. And that includes people like Ran and people like Mario, because as you can see, it is about building a relationship based food system that has less steps between the producer and the eater. And where the last step in the eater is at a neighborhood level. So any retail store that supports local procurement uh, and, uh, that, and, is, and it is at a neighborhood base where people can access walking is part of our strategy. And that's why we all need to come together as a sector. Public markets need to come together as a sector but public markets need to partner with other type of retail that are operating at the same scale. So it is about strengthening those relationships. And so um, this is what we have. So we always start with what we have. These are the markets in our city. And so public markets, um, what do they do? They have a public good. So this is not about just um, public um, food delivered by non-for-profits. This is food delivered by both for-profit profit enterprises that operate at a mid-sized scale or small size scale and the non-for-profits coming together and prioritizing food for the public good, not food only for profit. And that's the big difference. And also when profit is directed to the local community, it's a different versus the profit directed to transnational uh, global capitals that are outside of our city. And so I have mapped um, eight different types of markets in our city, municipal markets, semi-permanent markets, permanent markets, mobile markets, market networks, market districts, and wholesale markets. The Ontario Full Terminal was not part or it's not part integrated into our public market system. And it should, because as we saw before, it's a key actor in small and medium supply chains. Uh, and so this is what we have. We have 105 markets. This is data from 2009. Uh, obviously this changes from year to year. There's lots of data about the number of entrepreneurs, almost 3000 entrepreneurs, both uh, urban entrepreneurs, but regional entrepreneurs participate in markets. Um, they are, um, there obviously is a strong linkage because of the data we collected with the region. Uh, a lot of, uh, of um, local small producers is the only chance to access customers. And that's what we saw in COVID. We saw that the biggest challenge was that regional producers were limited uh, to access consumers or customers as we like to call them or co-producers as we like to call them. And so again, by strengthening our short supply chains and strengthening those relationships, what we can do is make sure that more and more both urban growers and uh, regional growers and local entrepreneurs have places to sell. Uh, and that's, I'm gonna just leave it at that. And so what are markets doing for us? Um, and again, there's not a lot of data um, and I'm gonna speak to that now when we spoke about, speak about the idea of market city. What markets are doing to us currently is they're promoting inclusion, diversity, and social connection. Um, that's what they do. Uh, there's a high number of women participating in markets. There's a high number of immigrants participating at markets. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of diversity within the vendor and the market manager's um, diver um, uh, demographic. We still need to work on the demographic on customers. Um, they provide access to fresh locally produced food. We know that global supply chains do not prioritize local food. Their procurement practices are grounded in global complex supply chains. So that's our value proposition. This is what we're good at. We are good at managing food locally. The problem is that the government and uh, has prioritized a private led food system that supports um, large um, supply chains. And therefore over the years, we have lost that mid-size infrastructure. And what it means is that our mid-size infrastructure needs to operate. We need to have producers, we need to have distributors, we need to have processors, we need to have retailers, and we need to have food waste facilities that operate at a similar scale. 
if we don't have them all operating at a similar scale, we're not able to work efficient, efficiently and effectively, nor reduce prices uh, for the consumer. And therefore, it is very important to have all the actors operating at the similar scale. And so they, what else do we do? Uh, we provide economic opportunities, as we said before. We create innovation and incubation in our city. We promote health, not only because markets are located in neighborhoods where you walk and you actively, you are active in your community, but also because we know that there's plenty of statistics that show that markets promote eating from fresh food uh, and cooking from scratch. And obviously because of all of those things and because of the amount of uh, travel that happens with shorter supply chains and packaging waste and food chains, we, food waste, we also advance climate action. Um, and so to get on the left hand side, you see how um, they align with the city's strategic priorities. And this is sort of, again, my knowledge, how I learned before I used to talk about all these things on a big, 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 big language, big words and hoping that the province will do something for us. But what we need to be doing at this point is linking to our municipal actors first. And so how do we strengthen our public market infrastructure within our city to create an inclusive approach for food distribution is we focus on our municipal efforts first, we find some allies there, and then we start linking regionally and then provincially. And so that's why this conversation is a lot about Toronto, but this model can be replicated in cities across Canada. And so market cities, which is your next question, Jocelyn, uh, what is a market city? So market city is a concept that I learned probably six years ago in Barcelona. And that is when a city intentionally brings actors together, market, public markets together not to see them as an individual places where food procurement happens, but to see them as a network of, of assets that provide not only access to fresh food, but also environmental, ecological and health benefits to the community. And it's linked to the idea, which is now everyone in, in, in is talking, um, especially the C40 network, this idea of walkable cities uh, and mobility and anchoring food in neighborhoods. And so Market City TO is uh, what we propose, and it is a plan to move Toronto public markets forward together. So a couple of things just to summarize very quickly what a market city is. A market city is uh, also, um, we have like seven principles that we have designed for market city. So I'm gonna name a few so that again, more people start to sort of grapple with this idea of why, why you go from a public market strategy to a market city strategy. It's like, first of all, a market city strategy brings all the different types of markets together. Before we were operating separately, each one of those red or colorful dots we saw on the map were working alone. Now it's about working together and bringing them all together. It's about measuring their impact and recognizing and using those data to really tell a good story and inform policy. It's about supporting entrepreneurs. It's about investing in infrastructure, both physical, but also uh, the social infrastructure that makes resilient cities. And it's about um, regularly investing in market management skills, which again, is something that we have struggled in our city. And so this is the potential. The potential is to really imagine what will happen if we brought all these markets together with a plan uh, integrated with other forms of retails and other actors within the system to really focus on increasing equitable access to fresh, nutritious, culturally blah, 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 appropriate food. That's a mouthful, but we wanna to touch on all these very important points because it's part of what has made us separate. So this document informs, is informed by the priorities of many. Um, and how do we do it? By strengthening that public food distribution infrastructure that I spoke to before. And what, it, what is the moment? The moment is to really advocate for COVID relief and recovery efforts to be allocated to this kind of transform food system transformation. Not the one that perpetuates um, solutions like food banks, which while needed and now uh, shouldn't be our, our default. Um, and so, 
this is the potential. This is the potential to create a 50 minute city. This is the, the yellow dots on the left is the markets we currently have with a half, half a mile radius of um, walkable. So that is estimated based on an average person either walking or moving in a mobility device or in a bicycle in their neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> and the one on the right hand side is what will happen if we plan for a city like that? What will happen if we actually plan and include all those green dots that allow to connect different types of markets, fresh food markets, community markets, and, and uh, retail markets, wholesale markets, all the different types of markets within our city working together to create a walkable city, not only for food, but also uh, for healthy communities. Marina, thank you. Um, this is terrific and you've given us so much to, um, to dive into here and I have a lot of follow up questions. Um, I know that we're getting a lot of questions in the Q&A as well from um, those who are joining us. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that with us and for bringing the visual materials as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jo um, and I know she has a, a question she'd like to pose as well um, to the round table. Um, and I, picks up really nicely, I think, Marina, about the point you made about supply chains um, and policy. So, so Jo. Uh, thanks, everyone. So we want to keep time for questions. So I'm actually going to ask just uh, Mario and Ran now, and then we'll move on to the questions, because I think responding to, you know, the way in which Marina has given us the big picture and then brought us back to the city-specific picture for local food solutions. So from your position as local food businesses, as retailers who work with a host of suppliers who are playing a frontline role in supplying, feeding the city, uh, what are some of the concrete policy measures that would help you do that better? Yeah, because part of what Feeding the City project is about is that we have also been asked to make recommendations that will go to policymakers, that will engage public information. And so what we can hear from you now <laughs> quickly, but of course, we are also going to follow up beyond this webinar. We're going to ask the audience to send us more follow-ups would be really great. So if we can take a few minutes to hear first uh, from uh, Ran perhaps, and then Mario, and then we will move to the quick Q&A because we already have a lot of questions that have come our way. Thanks. So first run and then Mario. Um, yeah, so in, so in terms of what the city of Toronto can do, I mean, I'm, again, I'm no policy expert, but I mean, I can certainly speak to the, the obstacles we faced as a business over the years. Uh, access to land is a huge one. I think the city is sitting on a lot of underused or unused land that should be opened up for urban agriculture in a systematic way. Uh, right now, it depends on you know, a group in a community lobbying for access to a hydro corridor or part of a park. And I think it just needs to be much more of a framework that uh, anybody can access land and it's clear what the criteria are to access it. Um, so I think access to land is a huge one. Uh, I think removing obstacles from, uh, from selling food, in particular local food, so whether it's um, streets, side stands, uh, making it easier for, uh, for grocery stores. So, uh, a silly example, you know, we, we need a business license to operate and um, it's a pain in the ass to get the business license. Like I have to go get a police background check and pay for this and show them my articles of incorporation, all these things that don't actually help them with anything. If the intent is to raise revenue, they should just charge for the license and that's it. But if I'm, I don't know, if I committed a crime, say, and I uh, ended up serving time and I'm back in the community, I don't see why I shouldn't be allowed to open a grocery store and why it's anybody's business. Uh, it's not a sensitive uh, uh, profession in that sense. Um, so I think there's a lot of small pieces of red tape, um, you know, up and down the city bureaucracy from, you know, zoning and permitting, licensing, uh, that ultimately just disadvantage uh, small business and in particular disadvantage um, uh, you know, uh, uh, immigrants and other, other marginalized communities by just creating this new bureaucracy. I mean, every time I go to East York Community Center to, to renew our, our business license, uh, you know, my, I just want to cry because you just, you, it's this big uh, area where there's a bunch of booths and you hear these different conversations and it's the same conversations. It's like, I don't have a notarized copy of our articles of incorporation and uh, da, 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 da. and I'm like, well, why create this, this, this huge um, uh, kind of red tape for no reason? 
Um, so I think that's one area that the city the city can do better. Um, I think around uh, um, you know public uh, health inspections. Um, you know, it's it, it, the 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 uh, well, in our experience, it's been pretty hit and miss in terms of what the standards are. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the best public health inspectors are uh, ones that uh, treat their job, uh, you know, seriously, but also as a uh, as an advocate for public health and to try to build capacity in the businesses they're working with. And you've seen a bit of that during COVID, where they'll come into you know the uh, our store and they say, you know, what uh, you could do this better, or you should add a screen here, and it's a much more of a consulting advisory role. Uh, as opposed to just a punitive one, which there's certainly a case, there's a there's a role for that as well. But I think in terms of uh, uh, playing a, um, a consulting role would be would be big. Um, so those are the ones that kind of immediately come to, to my mind in terms of what the city can play. But certainly a lot of what Marina um, speaks to, um, I think there needs to be you know an overarching uh, uh, perspective on prioritizing uh, local food and uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I think the city just needs to make it easier for for small entrepreneurs to win um, uh, because they're you know the, the impact they have in the community is uh, is so much so much more and so much more positive than um, you know a transnational multinational corporation opening another franchise or opening another another store. Thanks, Ran. It does sound like you know what you've outlined is uh, you know uh, measures that would simplify life <laughs> for really all the uh, different parts of the food system, uh, including Mario's and the vendors uh, at the public markets and Marina is talking about. Uh, but in fact, uh, before asking Mar uh, Mario to join in, I also wanted to draw everyone's attention to the news headlines that came just a couple of days ago that big supermarkets are going to charge suppliers more to offload increased pandemic business costs to them. So what impact might that have on small food businesses? And really, I mean, so there have been renewed calls for a code of conduct to regulate food businesses. But, you know, what does that mean? Is it something that's going to add another layer of bureaucracy for small food businesses? And will it actually do anything to rein in the big supermarkets who you know, in so many ways have been the winner from the winners from the pandemic situation. So Mario and then uh, quickly uh, run and then we will segue into the Q&A. And by the way, Marina, there's been a very positive response to your slideshow about the markets. And there are people sending you specific questions which we are going to steer away because we, as you know, we're also going to have a separate uh, webinar on public markets and uh, the global market project uh, next month. Uh, so sorry, Mario, over to you. Well, you said that they, uh, how the, the big supermarkets are gonna charge suppliers more to offload uh, uh, products and that. Uh, we are finding that um, a lot of our suppliers are uh, now implementing a little delivery charge where even though you've been dealing with them for 40 or 50 years or even 60 like us, uh, we're, we're pretty reluctant to, to, to pay those delivery charges. So then we don't have to charge our customers more. But uh, as it, it is what it is, I mean, uh, this pandemic has uh, touched every aspect of any retail uh, corner. So there are charges involved because the less staff, uh, their, their drivers are on the road more and they have to pay them more. The, the truck services, the courier, a lot of courier, a lot of companies now are, are choosing to take their trucks. A lot of companies now are, are choosing to take their trucks off the road and use couriers where it costs them more to get it to our local shops, not just mine. I'm speaking for every small, small, big and small shop. And uh, well, so far we haven't... Uh, had, had, had a real um, increase in, in our prices. We're doing the best we can to serve a, the, 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 our, our little pocket community here. And uh, we try and going back to the uh, growers and the look, we're trying to, we here at Maselli's uh, follow our local growers as far as we can. I mean, to, from broccoli to, to, to tomatoes to, to whatnot. Uh, we try to go as uh, we try to support our local growers a as far as far as we can, even if it, if it means going into the greenhouses later on and buying Ontario grown greenhouse products that that that's what we will do. Um, 
and that, that's it. Uh, shall I comment that, uh, Joe? Yes, please. Um, I mean, I think the answer to that is, is not a code of conduct. And I don't think these like periodic public outcries are going to move the needle. I think our federal government needs to get back in the business of antitrust uh, and, uh, and prevent this consolidation of the market that we've seen over the last 30 to 40 years. And that's, and, and, you know, people, this is, I don't know why this is, in my mind, hasn't percolated into the, um, the public sphere in, in, in as forceful a manner as it should. But what you know, in Canada, we have one of the most concentrated grocery sectors in the in the, in the developed world, uh, and there's consequences to that. And people, you know, the the the, the lens of antitrust and anti-competitive behavior has historically focused on uh, you know prices and keeping prices low, um, and um, uh, but that's a very narrow lens. And even there, I think there's some evidence of collusion, like I said, with the, the bread fixing, uh, price fixing scandal. Um, but really, it's, it impacts your whole food value chain. So if uh, the suppliers that we work with, so you know, for the most part, we work you know, on, the, on the produce side with farms directly, and we work with a lot of small producers. So to a certain extent, we're immune to it. Uh, but the reality of it is some things um, are, are more commodified. So the, you know, say the organic cereals we sell or things like that. And uh, you can bet that you know we're paying way more for them than a Loblaws is or uh, uh, or Sobeys is, uh, and that puts us at a disadvantage um, competitively for from from our customers' perspective. And so there's always going to be some element of obviously economies of scale. There's going to be big bigger businesses and smaller businesses, but the the extent of the consolidation of the market that has gone uh, with basically zero barriers or friction from the government uh, it, to me is astonishing. It's astonishing. And I would agree with you 100%. And that's, yeah. that's, that, that is, that is the, the, the grocery chains have become the gatekeepers of our food system, both because they control the prices to the producers and even the manufacturers. Uh, they have to um, sell the products the way they want them uh, in the format that they prefer uh, at the price that they need. Uh, and also the gatekeepers to the eaters because they are the ones that have controlled that access. And so that's why um, I agree with you 100% uh, that the government should move into antitrust sort of legislation. Um, the challenge that I find is that I don't see any indication that that is happening. Uh, it was funny, I was looking at research around the, uh, how the sort of essential service list uh, was uh, informed. And uh, I came across a document that is uh, from 2009 of um, the five uh, or nine key sectors that are working uh, in building our critical infrastructure for um, a crisis like a pandemic. Um, and it was, um, it was a, I can send the document, the link to everyone, uh, but it is a, a federal uh, document that is adopted by all the province uh, that outlines the, five, the nine sectors where we should be working and who are the key actors that are working on that building that critical infrastructure. And it was large scale private sector. Uh, and so again, we were preparing for this pandemic with the wrong people or not with all the people at the table. Uh, and that is systemic. And so as long as we don't change that, uh, we won't be able to change or transform our current food system because uh, those kinds of partnerships that transcribe federal, provincial, and municipal level then will make decisions. Uh, and it was funny enough because I was, uh, as I mentioned before, our list, uh, our, far, our first list of provincial rural um, essential, essential workplaces included the word market, markets. And that would have made our life so much easier because we would just focus on developing the protocols. Whereas, and grocery, like grocery stores, large scale grocery stores could, could just go and start figuring out how to operate in, this, in these difficult times. Whereas we spent three months of resources and energy to try to advocate for those, uh, for the designation. And then we had to develop the guidelines and then we had to start, learn how to operate. And so again, those double standards for me are not, um, not uh, just coincidence. They're part of those partnerships. Um, and so that's the big problem that we face in our food system. And I agree, retail consolidation is one of our biggest challenges. And that's why this 
project focuses on building that mid-size infrastructure for retail. Uh, thanks, Marina, Ran, and Mario. And uh, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm going to actually consolidate some of the questions we got. And so a question that we got from uh, an anonymous uh, audience member, I think in fact has been answered both during this uh, last round and in the first round, which is the one I had alluded to earlier, is that you know what we've learned during this time that will carry on or should carry on even when the pandemic is over. So I think you know what we just heard in the last five, 10 minutes about policy issues, about obstacles that actually <laughs> impede, especially small entrepreneurs, local immigrant food businesses, ones that can be sorted out at the city level, ones which come more from provincial and national policy. We uh, appreciate uh, the insights we've got from uh, all three of you. We will be putting these into the reporting we're doing in the Feeding City Project. And we also invite audience members to send further feedback from that. We have some very specific feedback about the markets initiative, which Marina can, uh, you know, people have given their names as well. So we are going to save those questions for Marina to answer separately, mm -hmm. especially because she's going to do another uh, similar webinar later on. But I wanted to bring forward for Mario and uh, Ran, the big questions, we have a set of questions which really are about the economic uh, footprint, <laughs> sorry, the ecological footprint of uh, uh, food retailing and which of course you know has taken new directions during the pandemic and what uh, you your businesses uh, are doing uh, can do in the future especially with increased supports um, to address that so uh, perhaps uh, first Mario and then Ran so this is about uh, the ecological uh, preventing food waste and you know, making sure that one's ecological footprint is as minimal as possible, which obviously is a huge challenge, especially during the pandemic, as we all can see if we just look around us on the streets. Well, um, food waste in a, on a retail s sector, uh, mm -hmm. let's say a small shop like mine, has always been a little bit of an issue. But in the last few years, um, I have found that uh, when some products are, let's just say, on their last legs, uh, we've uh, donated them to the church. What has to be thrown out gets thrown out. Don't get me wrong. But what can be salvaged, we have donated to the church, a couple of food banks. There are a few, uh, there, were, there are a few local charities uh, in our uh, community here. There are a few... Uh, uh, dinner makers, soup makers that will, uh, that I just gladly donate it, donate food just before, like when it still has a little bit of a uh, salvage, when it can salvage a little bit of life. Um, coming to this, pan it's always been the case in our shop, but coming to this pandemic, I make an extra trip now to the Ontario food terminal to not stock up. And uh, so everything is fresh and nothing does actually make it to the waste. I do the best, we try the best we can, even in our deli department. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't stockpile uh, like, like we used to. We, 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 we're selling more, but we, we don't stockpile like we used to. So nothing goes to waste, nothing uh, gets the, goes past the exp expiration date. Even in our meat department, meat arrives daily and we're getting a lot of orders because a lot of people are, are emailing their orders and uh, we have to deliver it. So everything must be fresh. And again, no stockpiling. So nothing goes to waste. And so, so uh, on a regular basis, we have deliveries come in in every day. The, the delivery, even that causes a little bit of a challenge. A lot of deliverers uh, do not want to come into the store, which I agree with that. They have, they, they, leave every, they leave everything on the side. We grab it in, they have to sanitize. They, they won't come in. We, they, we don't allow them to wheel it in anymore. They just leave it on the back dock. We take it from there. They sign in. They sign out. And, uh, yeah, so trying to minimize uh, has always been uh, a big challenge for a uh, retail store. 
uh, run because I know one of the issues, for instance, is that the fresh city boxes, which earlier you used to take back, now the cardboard boxes weak, the customers have to recycle, right? But I'm sure you are doing, you know, whatever's possible in the store. Yeah, so I guess a, cu a couple, uh, a couple of uh, parts to it. So I think there's you know a whole bunch of things we're trying to do to curb uh, food waste, and uh, I think you know curbing food waste starts in packaging. You know, weird, weird to say that, but you know, the right packaging can can curb uh, food waste in a big way. Uh, certainly around you know uh, we were implementing a new uh, ERP, uh, a new ERP system to help. Uh, you know, be able to pull past sales data to make you know better buying decisions, so you're not over um, overstocking up. To Mario's point, uh, you know, uh, composting, etc. Uh, but I think the part that we need to, to think about a bit and talk about a bit more, I think, is uh, there's been an overall consumer trend towards convenience uh, and towards fresh. Um, so you know, whereas we go from a place where you know a, a, a frozen was considered you know amazing back in the 50s and 60s, and has had a bad run recently, uh, but frozen actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of prepared foods uh, because it's um, it's a way to lock the nutrition and also to to enable you to use it whenever you want to. So it's less likely to go to waste at the, the distributor, at the retailer, or at the customer's side. Um, and similarly with fresh, I think you've seen. You know, the, the amount of a product uh, being sold fresh is increasing, both prepared foods, produce, et cetera. Um, and, you know, again, in a way it's good. It's kind of like it goes with the uh, zeitgeist of, you know, go to the uh, farmer's market and gets what, get what, what's fresh. And I think it works in certain contexts um, where, um, you know, people are doing small shops every day and buying what they need. Uh, so you're kind of allocating demand, uh, I think, efficiently. But I think we as a society have to think through, you know, what, you know, what, what are the repercussions of this of this uh, convenience uh, economy uh, that we we find ourselves in, and that uh, touches on everything from, you know, how much takeout we have and all the packaging that that uh, entails, um, to uh, you know the, our expectation when we walk into a grocery store and we want to see a bounty of produce and a bounty of uh, of uh, prepared foods uh, for our choosing. Um, and I don't know if there's easy easy answers to that, and uh, whether there's any easy policy levers to pull um, to to help uh, regulate those better. Uh, on our boxes, you know, we did um, before the pandemic. We had tote, tote bags um, that were used over and over again. Uh, in some cases, 20, 25 times. Um, uh, uh, but during the pandemic, a we ran out of bags uh, and weren't able to get more supply, and b um, customers were you know getting more and more nervous about having a reusable container like that. Uh, so we did move to cardboard, uh, which is recyclable, but you know, not, not ideal in the sense it's not reusable. Um, so currently we're at the beginning of stages, beginning stages, I think we're gonna ride the cardboard until COVID um, peters out hopefully, uh, and look to reinvest in a different reusable vessel because we have learned a lot um, during COVID about you know, how uh, a bag versus a box. So we'll likely go with some kind of box going forward. Uh, and likely uh, kind of a bespoke custom custom made box for for our purposes, um, but uh, it's a it's a huge uh, it's a huge and uh, complicated question uh, packaging. Um, so we still use quite a bit of reusable packaging for our food in the form of glass jars and bottles, etc. That are, are that do come back and that's worked pretty well. And we just bought the mother of all dishwashers to help uh, deal with that better, um, the returns better. And more efficiently, but um, it's it's again it's one of those one of those questions that uh, I, I you know it re re requires a good policy response, and I'm you know glad to see some of the movement by the liberals on this front uh, federally. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot a lot more work to be to be done. Uh, but again, the packaging question I think needs to be balanced with the food waste question, which I think is sometimes lost. Sometimes when you reduce packaging, you know the right kind of packaging. Uh, you end up wasting more more food. Uh, thanks, um, Mar um, Marina. I can give you forty seconds. <laughs> well, I just want to go. I just want to comment yeah. that I think in both cases, um, what they are talking about is that missing middle. So the missing infrastructure for processing food in an effective way. And so I was yesterday in a call with a city around. Uh, they're having the same problem with packaging waste at food banks and not being able to get enough packaging. Um, and so I proposed, why don't we start washing and 
repurposing and using kitchens across the city to, to, uh, to create those kinds of innovations and solutions, which is again, build that middle-sized infrastructure. But it takes time and it takes investment and it's, a, it's visionary. Like you have to say, okay, I'm gonna create a new sector, which is the sector that instead of recycling is repurposing. And so where do you put those, do who is gonna put the dollars to build the repurpose industry, not the recycle industry? I think that's at, at, at the level that we needed, mid-sized. Exactly. And I think repurposing is actually a really, really good term to bring in here. And, you know, the audience members who've asked have been using the term recycling. And I think it's a useful way in which to kind of say that, because as we know that we put things in the blue box for recycling, but so much of it actually goes into landfill. And so repurposing is actually something we need to bring front and center in terms of our own practices, but also policy measures. So we have so many wonderful questions that have come in and some <laughs> Mario and Ron may be happy to know that actually we have a couple of people who have asked how small food producers can get in touch with you. And I'm going to just say at this point that when we share the link to the recording, as we will with everyone who's registered, we're also going to have the contact details for the businesses and the speakers at this panel so that you can email them and get in touch with them separately, whether you are, uh, there are a couple of people who want to know if they can volunteer to work with uh, the markets initiative, for instance. And I think that's really the way in which, uh, so I apologize to the people who've asked questions because we haven't been able to take questions individually, but I think we've got into the spirit of things. And so thanks everyone for contributing to this vibrant conversation on the role that local businesses and public markets play in feeding our city. We've covered a lot of ground, highlighting key challenges, but also new opportunities to support our communities. We want to thank our panelists for taking the time to join us today and generously sharing their knowledge and stories. We also thank uh, the University of Toronto's Culinaria Research Centre and IITS for hosting and the Toronto Scarborough COVID-19 initiative that has provided funding for making our Feeding City Pandemic and Beyond project possible. So we will be continuing to offer these public webinars. We invite you to visit our website and social media pages. Please look out for future roundtables featuring Ontario ecological farmers, possibly in December, CSA networks and farmers markets, halal food networks and food support volunteer efforts from neighborhoods across uh, the city that have worked endlessly day to day to fight food insecurity throughout the pandemic. And we also plan another roundtable and we would appreciate people getting in touch on that, which is to highlight the local, the role of local restaurants, especially family run ones. So please look out for partner events at the Culinary Research Center, one that features indigenous and black food sovereignties and another event which will include Marina, uh, showcasing public markets in different world cities from Barcelona to Toronto. So thank you everyone and uh, Please visit uh, our pages. Please visit the social media and web pages of uh, the uh, speakers who, who have so kindly given their time and expertise today. And we will be sharing many more of these ideas and insights through the blog that we have on the Feeding City website, as well as our a mailing list which will share this recording and feel free to send it further because the more feedback the more public engagement we have on these issues that we've heard from our speakers that's better thank you so much